Good evening to you all and Namaskar. Ambassador, Consul General, dear friends. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, if I'm looking a bit dazed, it's because I stepped off a plane just a little while ago. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a long trip. Uh, you all know that. Uh, for me, it's the first trip to Brazil. Uh, though I must say it's not for lack of trying. Uh, we had uh, uh, plans over the last two, two and a half years and somehow between the COVID and, you know, scheduling, uh, it didn't work out. But first of all, let me really begin by uh, complimenting all of you uh, because uh, I know what it's like to live outside your country. I have done so myself. And I know what it's like to keep the flag flying, to keep your traditions, your culture, your emotional connect, your businesses, your activities. And from everything that I've read and I heard from Ambassador and Consul General, uh, I think you're all doing a splendid job. Uh, and I really thank you for it because in many ways, uh, what is the perception of India? What is the image of India? is very much formed by the Indian community. And uh, so uh, even as I prepare to go into Brasilia, I know that in many ways, uh, what you have all done is part of the groundwork uh, for my own visit. Now, uh, today is the, the 20th still, right? Okay, so it's the 20th uh, and I bring you uh, greetings of Independence Day. Greetings of Independence Day just five days ago, uh, where we completed 75 years of our independence, uh, what celebrating what we call Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav. And I bring you not only the greetings, but I, having um, participated, having been present uh, at Red Fort uh, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed the nation. Uh, I also remind you uh, of his key message on that occasion because uh, I think when today when we complete 75 years of independence, uh, the mood in the country is very optimistic. It's a very forward looking mood. So it's natural people would think, okay, what did we uh, do in the last 75 years? Uh, but uh, the feeling is also very much what should we be doing. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, the Prime Minister has put forward this idea that let's think about where we will be on our centenary. That between now and the centenary, the 25 years, the Amrit Kal that awaits us. And his message five days ago was that if India and Indians really took five pledges and sincerely implemented it. Uh, it would really uh, perhaps uh, put us in a, in a completely different orbit 25 years from now. And those five pledges, I remind you, were uh, to strive to make India a developed country, to put the colonial mindset behind us, to be proud of our heritage and traditions, to develop a stronger sense of unity uh, within the country, and uh, most important, to focus on our duties. And I say this to you because partly to share with you what is the thinking at home, and that's something which, uh, even though I know in this day and age we are all connected, uh, nevertheless, it's something which uh, is of interest to you. But because I think these five uh, pledges, in a way, are equally relevant to Indians, people of Indian origin, friends of India who are abroad, that a reminder that we need to strive, we need to set bold aspirations that it is within our capability, today we are a $3.3 trillion economy, it is within our capability to 
double that very rapidly in the coming years uh the 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 need uh, as the prime minister said to really be much more confident about our own culture and traditions uh, and to get over the 200 years of colonialism and uh, a sense of commitment towards our own country uh, towards our own society uh, and that is best done really by reminding ourselves of our duties now having said that uh, what i would uh, also emphasize is that the last few years for india like for anybody else for any other country have not been easy years they have not been easy years largely because of the covid uh, there's hardly a family which has not been touched in some way by the covid uh, i think uh, everybody in the world suffered some more some less but it is really during periods of difficulty that leadership becomes evident that the character of a society is tested that the capability of a country is in evidence and as some someone who's went through that period in india uh and i myself was part of a group of ministers who were charged with uh monitoring the covid situation and uh sort of making recommendations to the prime minister uh i would like to uh in a sense uh, urge you to think about it because how india responded to the covid challenge in many ways tells you what has changed in india so what has changed i think the first achievement in a way the fact that we've had more than 2 billion people vaccinated 2 billion people vaccinated uh, it's not just the scale it's the the fact that we did it pretty much synchronized with the rest of the world that it was done using a made in india vaccine and invented in india vaccine that it was done uh using a digital platform which organized that vaccination so that you could do it on the scale without the accompanying you know pulls and pushes and people converging uh, on the same spot it was an extremely organized uh, way of vaccination and uh, i emphasize this because even today as i travel around the world i still see other countries many of them struggling both with the scale and with the efficiency and with the actual challenge of getting there are countries which have the vaccines but can't actually get the shots in the arm the people who got the shots in the arm but don't have the certification and the organization to do that uh, and uh, because covid hasn't gone away there's still the anxiety of you know how do we continue Uh, to deal with it but it wasn't only what we did at home uh, we had we embarked during this period uh, on a initiative called vaccine maitri uh, brazil was one of the uh, partners of that so very early on uh, actually uh, even in in 2020 uh, we sent hydroxychloroquine uh, to brazil uh, and uh, then when the vaccine started to be produced uh the worshipments of astrazeneca which were sent here and through all of this we faced the challenge actually of a very large number of indians who were stranded abroad uh indians who were students indians who were tourists indians who were seafarers uh indians who were uh who were professionals or workers who had lost their jobs and indians who were family members who wanted to go back at some point of time uh, and see their near and dear ones and i know there were some people in brazil also uh, who availed of the vande bharat uh, uh, facilities that we organized but i i mention all this to you not just to emphasize the fact that you know we went through these trials and tribulations and we believe we have come out of it stronger but to 
underline to you whether it is actually the vaccination at home, it, what we did with partners abroad, uh, the manner in which we looked after our citizens, uh, that this is an India which is capable of big things, uh, which in many ways probably exceeded its own expectation. You know, I, I still recall the early days of the COVID, you know, when it caught us so unprepared, uh, we were wondering, you know, where to get the masks and uh, what to do with the ventilators and the PPEs. So from where we started and what we built up in those two years, it is actually a lesson to us what we are capable of. And here I would also particularly mention the contribution of the diaspora because uh, in 2021, when we went through the Delta wave, uh, really, uh, I mean, I would say the world stood by us, but Indian communities everywhere abroad uh, really contributed, uh, did whatever they could to help us out, and that's something which we deeply appreciate. Now, two years, two years of COVID, two and a half years of COVID, uh, we then found ourselves with a new challenge, and a challenge which came uh, from a very different geography. Uh, this time it was the Ukraine conflict. The consequences of the Ukraine conflict on our daily lives, and it actually tells us really how globalized the world has become, that something happens in one corner of the world and everybody else is impacted by it. Uh, and here too, you know, there was a human side to it. The fact that there were 20,000 students uh, who were stuck in uh, Ukraine, uh, but uh, who we were very determined we would bring back uh, unharmed. Unfortunately, one person did lose his life. Uh, but uh, we were the country actually who brought out the largest number of people uh, through an organized effort once the conflict started. And that too, Operation Ganga that we did, that too was, even for our own society, a validation of capabilities and leadership and thinking and boldness and commitment and organization. That to do, put all this together in the middle of a war uh, to, to get people out uh, it was something which, which really uh, uh, was, was uh, quite a feat. Uh, but today we are coping with other aspects of it, and I think particularly uh, what it has done uh, in terms of uh, impacting our energy security is something which is of concern. Uh, and here too we have a challenge, which is uh, we uh, have to ensure uh, through diplomacy uh, through uh, dealings with various governments, that our economic interests are well protected, uh, that the Indian consumer is uh, shielded to the extent possible from this enormous jump in oil prices that we have seen, uh, that our national economy is not uh, adversely impacted by this, uh, and it is something which is still ongoing, And uh, but uh, again, there has been a very strong level of commitment uh, to ensure that our, uh, uh, that our national interests in regard to energy are somehow met. Now, I started with these two because obviously as a foreign minister, uh, these have been my major preoccupations in the last three years. It's something obviously very much in my mind. But I also want to share with you what's happening at home. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been able to go home this year. Uh, last two years, I understand, would have been very difficult. And even if you went home, it's probable that you went home, met your families, went to that immediate town, and then came back. Now, as someone who travels within the country, I'd like to give you, in a sense, that picture. Now, I again go back to the COVID. You know, when we had the lockdown, uh, uh, when we had the enormous disruption of the COVID, uh, one of the big concerns that the Prime Minister reminded us of 
was that a hundred years ago when the Spanish flu hit India, more people died of hunger than they died of the flu. And he was absolutely determined this would not happen on his watch. So we act, what we did during these two years was really put the digital backbone which had been erected, uh, measures which had been taken with some degree of foresight. For example, the idea that everybody should have a bank account, Jandhan Yojana. Now, because people had a bank account, because people, everybody had an Aadhaar number, uh, because there were other ways of ensuring uh, digitally that we were able to communicate with the citizens uh, in an effective manner, we have actually, through this entire COVID period, right up to this point, under the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana, we continue to provide food to 800 million people. The scale of that has never been done in the world before. It's not something you read often in the newspaper. Uh, in our own country, once it moved, people took it as, you know, it happened. They, they absorbed it, they internalized it. Uh, because people had bank accounts, actually the government was putting money directly into 400 million accounts regularly, of which the vast majority were women. Now, this 800-400 story, the story which you don't read about in the papers, is really what has kept India going. That we did not have what we could have had, the accompanying economic distress from the COVID lockdown. So when people wonder sometimes, how did we come back to normalcy so quickly? Why is it that there is a bounce back? At the, at the heart of it is that we actually, between health, between food, between direct cash payments, we were actually able to create a massive social security net based on this digital backbone, almost on the run. And that is one of the big transformations that has taken place in India today. It's not the only transformation. In fact, in parallel with that, there are a range of other activities which are taking place. Uh, some of them you would have heard of, like replacing firewood with cooking gas. Some of them, if you're not directly a beneficiary, maybe you read about it. Uh, today we are really providing houses in the millions, uh, both in the rural areas and in the urban areas. Uh, the, the health coverage, Ayushman Bharat, is growing very, very rapidly. The support to farmers uh, is also something. And in fact, when I look at the scale of these programs, and these are programs which is what we do when we travel about in India, we look at it, we monitor it, we speak to the beneficiaries of it, we get complaints about it, which we give as a feedback uh, uh, to our colleagues or to the Prime Minister. Each of these programs is almost the size of a, the beneficiary size of a big country. You know, many of them, I mean, the food, for example, is as big as Europe and North America put together, 800 million. The, the finance is as big as Europe. Uh, even if you look at two big programs which are going on, one more advanced, the uh, power connection to every house. And the other one which is going on right now is tap water connection. Now, there are parts of the world where people don't understand what that means because they were born with an electricity connection and born with tap water. So the idea that you didn't have it itself doesn't occur to them. But for all of you who, who are so familiar with your uh, country, uh, you know that this itself is a revolution of a kind. And these schemes are today real, really running into hundreds of millions. And the, the, uh, when we look at the future, the one of the big objectives is really to shift the baseline of India higher. That 
in this day and age in the 22nd century people should not think of water and power and house and education and health as luxury they should not have to wait till the end of their working life to say okay finally with my savings i bought a house that is not really where we should be as we are approaching 100 years of independence and it's those goals today which is really what is driving uh, the transformation of india now having spoken to you about india let me say a few words about india and brazil because that is why uh, i am here uh you know politically we have had good relations for a long time they have become better uh, i had the privilege of uh, welcoming uh, president bolsonaro when he had come to india uh, and uh, i can say that after the visit as the ambassador pointed out uh, there's really been a, a kind of a a focus and a energy in the relationship which perhaps uh, there was not earlier so how do we look at the relationship when i go to brasilia you know my message in a way is that for us brazil is a key partner but brazil is also a country from whom there are many learnings for india there are experiences and best practices in brazil uh, from which we could benefit and in a sense when i say we are a partner i mean obviously being a partner means you do more business uh, that is today the basic index of how well a relationship is doing uh, but there are other aspects to it uh, it's also the cultural bonding uh, it is the civil society the the softer areas education science and technology but our sense of that partnership is where do we india and brazil how can we actually support each other so that in our respective rise in the global order uh, we can be of help to each other so that is really the mindset with which we are today looking at the relationship now starting with trade uh, i think it's going up uh, it's been a it's been a good year it's been a good two years actually uh, but clearly the you know the more you do the more the vistas open up uh, so uh, for me uh, today you know when i look at latin america as a whole our trade account is a little bit below 50 billion dollars uh, when i compare it to some other big regional hubs like asean or the gulf uh, leave alone europe or north america those are 100 billion dollar plus accounts so i mean this sounds a bit corporate so you will smile at it but i think our target really should be how do we double this you know how do we make latin america 100 billion dollar account trade account and the heart of that is brazil because it is the biggest economy it is the one which for us is the strongest uh, fit uh, and uh, uh, for brazil itself uh, the immediate target is to reach a 15 billion dollar uh, uh, level uh, but clearly i think we need to think bigger and that too is a message that i would be carrying this related to that is investment uh, and again i mean there are many of you in the room uh, who been here for some time who doing great work uh, i see whether it is power whether it is agriculture whether it's pharma whether it's it Uh, from our side uh, our areas of strength uh, are are uh, here uh, i actually uh, looked at my briefing books and looked at the list of companies who have a footprint in this country and it's a very good list but it is still a list where you know the footprint is there but the footprint is in big enough it is in deep enough and we understand it will take time to grow so i do want to tell the indian businesses in the room that we are committed really to uh, supporting you uh, we know that business grows only by having its problems addressed uh, uh, we have been uh, quite uh, 
energetic in that regard. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I do expect issues of market access and any other impediments to business uh, to be raised. Uh, if there are there is any concern you have, I would like to hear it also at the end of this meeting. Uh, the third, of course, is energy. Energy uh, in this country, both in terms of fossil fuel, and we've had uh, OVL and BPRL here for some time. Uh, uh, BPRL is scaling up its commitment. Uh, but there is the whole ethanol story. Uh, we are the third largest uh, ethanol producer. I think there's a natural synergy with Brazil in making actually ethanol much more global. Uh, if if the number two, num number three producers really get together and, and propagate the virtues of ethanol and uh, really make it a much more universal uh, commodity, uh, I think there's a, there's a convergence there. Uh, our our uh, dealings on defense have gone up. Again, that we've started some joint ventures there. Uh, space has been an area. Uh, last year, we launched a Brazilian satellite. We use Brazilian ground stations uh, for our own space missions. Uh, and uh, then, of course, again, as the ambassador mentioned, my colleague Purshottam Rupalaji was here recently. Animal husbandry is an area really there's a lot for us to learn uh, from Brazil. Uh, and uh, then the there are some areas which we have, you know, we've kind of explored it, uh, but there's such visible potential that, you know, it, it clearly is begging for a bigger effort on our part, and I think traditional medicine there. Uh, is something which is um, high in our priority. Uh, the WHO actually uh, this year has just announced its first global traditional medicine center, uh, which is in uh, to be set up in Jamnagar in Gujarat. So we see ourselves really becoming a kind of a global hub for traditional medicine. And Brazil, again, is a natural partner uh, for that. And uh, finally, of course, you know, given the diversity of India and given the diversity of Brazil, uh, I think the, the cultural, uh, that there is a cultural synergy there. It's important for the relationship to go that we should have a better sense of uh, each other's cultures and traditions. Now, that's where the, uh, the uh, narrow relationship itself is concerned, or the bilateral relationship is concerned. But we work with Brazil uh, in terms of world politics as well. We are right now in the Security Council. Uh, we have, we are both members of BRICS. Uh, we are part of a, another grouping called IPSA. Uh, so, so in many ways, this is, you know, this is a rela relationship of good sentiment, of great goodwill. Till now, it has been a relationship of some distance. So our job today, our task today, is really how to shrink that distance. And to shrink that, and, and it's doable, you know. It's doable because, in fact, the more business we do, uh, that itself is a statement that distance is shrinking. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we the, the idea today that it's possible to competitively export and import to the other end of the world. That, I think, is, is by now well established. So it could be oil, it could be, I mean, it could be edible oil, it could be fuel oil, uh, it could be, uh, you know, consumables, it could be auto parts. I, you know, the, the world is getting uh, more efficient in terms of its logistics. Uh, our vision of who our partners are uh, should grow beyond the region. Uh, in a way, I mean, definitely I can say India is becoming much more globalized. Uh, our effort is to encourage Brazil also uh, to look uh, beyond the traditional markets, look much more at Asia, uh, particularly uh, look much more at India. So uh, for me, uh, when I look at the development of the relationship and its prospects, the role of the Indian community will become even more important because eventually that shrinking of distance 
that expansion of comfort, that, that sense of putting a face to a country or a company, that is something which all of you do. Uh, and I have seen in different parts of the world where I have been, that when relationships really remarkably change, a big part of it is really the catalytic role of the community because the policy makers or the doers in the other partner society, for them, they relate to, to Indians, they relate to communities like you, they relate to individuals, they relate to companies. And that fires them up and encourages them really uh, to do bigger things than uh, they were doing habitually. So uh, for all of you, I, I would uh, uh, urge you that, you know, please keep doing what you're doing, but do more. Uh, please think of yourself as, you know, contributors at a very important stage of our relationship. We are really today poised to make that big jump. Uh, and to make that big jump, we need all the support uh, that we can get. And back home, uh, as I said, I want to assure you today, uh, we have a government with a vision. Uh, we have clearly, and Prime Minister Modi, uh, a government with a leadership, uh, one with a very strong sense of delivery. Uh, as I uh, said, uh, a lot of it uh, is really uh, the transformation of India is no longer in phrases. Uh, it is actually visible in numbers. It is evident on the ground. Uh, you, I mean, anywhere you travel in India today, you can actually literally see change underway. You know, there's a road being built, there's a rail line being built, there's some container depot coming up. I mean, you can you can almost sort of feel the hum and the buzz. Uh, of that change. Uh, so uh, it is with that sense of optimism, uh, that uh, feeling of hope uh, that I uh, share with you uh, this evening. Uh, once again, I want to say it's truly a great pleasure uh, to be able to spend time with all of you. And I'm very glad I'm doing this so that it empowers me as I go into Brasilia. Thank you very much.